Okay. Hi guys, how are you? Uh, welcome again. Uh, I'm very proud to announce our first fireside of the day. Uh, we're going to have two great entrepreneurs here. Uh, doing the interview, we will have a great entrepreneur who is also a great writer and he's an awesome friend. His name is uh, John Rampton. I'm introducing to the other great entrepreneur. He had just four IPOs, 20 years as an entrepreneur, and now he's devoted on creating amazing uh, programs to educate how to learn startups. Um, let's give a big, big round of applause for John Rampton and Steve Blank. All right, let's see if they do that at the end. I know, I, I'm really wondering if they're going to as well. Uh, how's everybody doing? You guys doing good? How was Guy Kawasaki, you guys? Pretty good? Yeah, that was pretty great. Um, well, uh, let, let's jump into it. To, first, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, tell me the brief, you know, two minute version of yourself. Um, let's see, uh, entrepreneur for 21 years, eight startups in Silicon Valley, um, and then a subsequent career as an educator for the last 15 years teaching at Stanford, Berkeley, and a couple other places. Okay. So you, you've been doing this for a while. If you could go back in time, go back in your you know, early 20s, what would you have done different? Nothing. Nothing. You, you know, one of the... Uh, one of the great things about uh, being an entrepreneur is uh, looking back and never saying coulda, shoulda, woulda. And uh, if, if you are thinking that you're hesitating, uh, you're in the wrong career. Uh, this is kind of an all-in game. And uh, uh, for me, I, I couldn't believe I got paid uh, to do what I did. You know, entrepreneurship is the uh, world's worst job, and it's the world's best calling. And if you're not called to this, then you shouldn't be in it. And for my 20s and 30s, that's the career I lived, and I couldn't think of a better thing to doing with my life. Um, as I got older, I thought of lots of better things to do with my life, but uh, uh, that's only because I, I would, got lucky and was able to do that. But um, no, I, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Good. So, so this is a question for the now, audience. Now, if you ask me about my teen years, you know, that's uh, my... A little different. Still won't tell my kids. But. <laughs> Oh uh, my, I wonder about that as well. Um, so this is a question for the audience, just by a raise of hands. How many uh, in the audience are founders or part of founding teams? Raise or your hand. Or wannabe. Or wannabe. Yeah. So that's, that's a very, very large percentage. And you notice most of them are sitting up front because they figure out how to get the seats. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is very true. Yeah. I've, had, I've heard reports of people bribing $10 for front seats. So. Um, True story. Um, so for all the founders in the audience, what would be your number one tip or recommendation for them? Well, you know, there's a set of tactical tips, which are, uh, and I think Guy's list of top 10 is, I, I, I always used to print them out and use them as crib notes myself when I was an entrepreneur. Um, but the biggest trap I used to fall into is, uh, you know, confusing your own BS uh, reality distortion field with, and raising money with success. Um, you know, fundraising has nothing to do with success. I mean, I don't even know like the people I, I give money to open champagne then. You know, getting customer orders is success. Um, celebrating raising money um, is like for a guy going out and buying condoms before the first date. I mean, you're being very optimistic about the outcome. Um, we've, we've all been guilty. We've and, all been guilty. And, 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 you know, yeah, been there, done that. But, but and then two, uh, you know, the, the, just an adjunct to that is, and this one took me 15 years to realize it, the minute you take money from someone else, their business model has now become yours. Which means is, if you've taken money from a venture capitalist and you can't draw how they make money, you're screwed. Because yeah. you will one day end up in a board meeting thinking that, well, after six years, I got a 3x offer and, you know, that's good enough, let's sell the darn thing, and you find out your VCs are happy for you to run into the ground because that's not worth doing. Boy, yeah. you didn't understand their business model. Um, and then the second is, and other adjunct to this, 
is understanding, and I think this was part of guys number 10, but I'll expand it, your VCs are a business. Well, they might like you, they might whatever, you're actually part of a liquidity Ponzi scheme of theirs and yours. Um, that is, very few of them have a goal to get to Mars um, or change the world. There are some, but most of them have a set of metrics of uh, IRR, internal rate of return, and, and they have bosses and they have uh, goals to make money. Yeah. Uh, and, and so their goal is to get you liquid one way or another sell your company, or in the old days, go public, or whatever. And that's their goal, and that's what they're managing you to, and they'll support you to do that, uh, but that's about it. And if you don't understand you're part of that process, you're gonna be sometimes sorely disappointed. So what do you recommend? How do I, how do I find the right investors for that? Well, I would go back um, maybe even to more basics. If you don't love what you're doing as an entrepreneur, yeah. this is not gonna be a fun ride. Because as, as I said, this is a miserable job. Yeah. But, but being a founder, for those who raised your hand wanting to be part of a founding team or a founder, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and founders are closer to artists than any other profession. That is, if you think about what artists do, they hear things that other people don't. They see things that other people don't. They, they use that vision and passion to drive through all the miserable times. No one's buying their art or listening to their music or whatever, but they do it anyway because they're driven to express yeah. something that they have inside of them. That's what great founders do. And if you're not driven by that, you're gonna treat this like a job. And, and to tell you the truth, um, in Silicon Valley, it's kind of hard to support yourself in this job. In fact, you're better off in the long run working at Walmart than joining a startup. Yeah. Um, but if you're a founder, this is the world's best thing to do. So what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, what are early, what are mistakes you see entrepreneurs really focusing on, especially here in the Valley and yeah. all over the world that they shouldn't? So, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, my work, Eric Reese's work, uh, Alexander Osterwalder, we put together something called the Lean Startup Methodology. Yeah. And that was the reaction to how we used to build startups in the 20th century. In the 20th century, our VCs, investors in Silicon Valley, essentially said, without ever quite saying this, startups are just simply smaller versions of large companies. Large companies write business plans, we want you to write a business plan. Large companies write five-year forecasts, and oh, what a surprise, it says $100 million in year five, we want you to do that. And, you know, they hire sales, marketing, biz dev, engineering, we want you to do that. Without understanding that, no, they're not. Large companies execute known business models, but startups search for them. Yeah. And so I guess number one is, we now know that the skill sets of a founding team are very different than a large company. Yeah. In a large company, you're, excuse me, in a startup, you're operating in chaos 24-7, and in fact, you're looking to test a series of hypotheses about product market fit, that is, what's the right feature set for the right customer segment, yeah. and you're running out, running a series of tests in real time. Yeah, so, you know, kind of going along the founder a little bit, how are all these founders different than everybody else? Well, they're crazy. Uh, I think they're crazy in as fact, well. They're certifiable. Um, I just keep going back to, here, I'll give you an example. So when I teach in business schools, almost every year I still get this. I still get a student coming up and saying, Professor Blank, I got a choice of jobs. I need your help. What's the choice? And almost every year it's, well, I got an offer from McKinsey. And I go, McKinsey, what a great offer. That's, you know, you can't get better than that. Consulting, what's, what's the other choice? Well, me and my roommates are thinking about doing a startup. <laughs> And I kind of go laugh, but, you know, like, I say, you've already decided. And they go, no, no, let me tell you about the startup. And I go, no, you've already decided. McKinsey is the world's best job, yeah. but a startup is the world's best calling. If you think that there's an equal choice between a job and a calling, you're actually not committed to being an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur and a founder is something that you wake up at three in the morning and start taking notes. You're thinking about you know, what you could do on the, on the drive to work or better in the shower in the morning. You know, you're like 24 seven. I mean, you, and, and you're operating with, as, as Guy mentioned, you know, multiple things are going on and you love it. There's nothing more exciting in your life. Yeah. McKinsey's a great job. And so my yeah, advice great, is great, great go job. take the job. So who else here works from the shower? Oh, okay, that's a little bit embarrassing. It was kind of a joke, but uh, 
I'm glad we got at least 10% of the audience to admit that they were. But here's shower. something else to admit, and this one, um, you know, what I realized after asking about 500 entrepreneurs and I stopped is that one of the key characteristics of a founder, besides having some that are quite similar to artists, is that I'd say over half of Silicon Valley founders come from dysfunctional families. Yeah. Uh, and by dysfunctional families, you know, either emotionally or physically abused or a chaotic situation, or for those who are immigrants from the, uh, to the country who've traveled long physical or emotional distances to come here. And, and it's probably the cruelest most, but most effective training ground on how to be a founder. Perhaps, uh, maybe with the exception of being a platoon leader in Fallujah. Um, you know, that ability to kind of shut out everything except what's important for survival um, turns out to be exactly the skill set you need to be a founding CEO. Yeah. Because there, everything is coming at you, there is no right answer, and you just need to be focused on what's important for survival while remembering that your eye is on the prize. Um, and uh, when I actually figured this out, I went to a woman who was a mentor of mine, Catherine Gould, um, so unfortunately no longer with us, but I said, Catherine, look what I figured out, you know, like some of the best founders are from dysfunctional families. And Catherine looked at me and said, Steve, why do you think we funded you? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it turns out it's a truism, great VCs actually have pattern recognition skills to figure that out about founding teams. And, and so for those of you who come from that family or that type of family, you should know for the first time in your lives you actually have a strategic advantage um, <laughs> that the rest of you who come from normal families, and by the way, for those of you working for CEOs who come from that, um, it explains why they, when things get normal, that is when they now have found a repeatable pattern and now the company is just in execution mode, these same CEOs throw hand grenades into their own company to keep the chaos going. Yeah. If you've ever worked for those people, that explains that behavior. So, If any of you are in that boat, yeah. eh, keep it yeah. going, because apparently it's working. It does work. Um, so you, speak to, you spoke a little bit about patterns. Right. What are repeatable patterns that some of these founders are missing? Well, um, you know, I think the, the biggest pattern, and, and now it's pretty well understood, um, is, is that unless you have product market fit, um, and, and even un, unless you even understand what product market fit is, um, you're most likely going to fail unless you could flip the company early and often. Um, yeah. and, and by that I mean, you know, when you start out, you have a, a vision of here's the product, here's the customers, here's what it looks like, and you think, gee, I'm a real visionary. You know, we have 50 years of data in Silicon Valley that says, uh, well, you think you're a visionary, the data says you're actually hallucinating. Um, <laughs> and, and so the real question is, how do we turn that hallucination into something more effective? And we now have a methodology that says, you know, let's take your hypotheses about what you think you're building, and yep. let's figure out if we could find people early on who care enough to grab it out of your hands. Um, and we could do that without spending a ton of money because we used to find that out after what we used to call first customer ship. Yeah. Um, we do alpha, beta, first customer ship, spend a lot of money, nobody's buying, fire the VP of sales, iterate, fire the VP of marketing, iterate, you know, founder becomes, you know, chief strategy officer, <laughs> et cetera, um, and depending on the economic environment, keep going. We now have a methodology that allows us to build products iteratively in it and um, incrementally and actually do this rapid learning. Yeah. So I, you're into data a lot, yep. correct? Now, uh, who else is into data? Anybody use, use data to make decisions? Really? No one. Anybody? Yeah. Data to use decisions? Yeah. We got at least one person in the crowd, front row. Thank you, mom. Um, yeah. But uh, Actually, that's the one going public. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is there a point when data Sure. You shouldn't use it. Sure. So, you know, the famous uh, Thomas, uh, uh, famous Henry Ford quote is, if I would have listened to my customers, I would have built a horse with six legs, <laughs> or, or Steve Jobs, who said, you know, customers don't know what they want, really kind of missed the point about, um, about startups. It turns out there are startups in an existing market. What's an existing market? Well, you know, there's already competitors. Customers can describe the market. You could actually go out and ask customers what's the basis of competition, and they will tell you. So going out and getting data in that market, doing a customer development process, makes all the sense in the world. 
But what as Steve Jobs and Henry Ford was describing, and what Clinton Christensen does wonderfully well, is describe a new market. In a new market, it's still called the startup. And the problem is we don't have separate words for these, but they're very different startups. In a new market, there are no customers. Um, you know, there are no competitors, which is why I used to love those markets, but go back to step one, there are no customers. And so, it, whereas in an existing market, your sales curve should look like this, in a new market, it's a canonical hockey stick with you praying that there's some curve at the end before you run out of cash. Um, and in a new market, customer discovery and customer development is much different. In an existing market, you can ask specific questions about gathering data about features and product market fit, et cetera. In a new market, you're trying to envision what does the world look like today and what would it look like when my product gets out there and what yeah. needs to change for adoption to happen. Yeah. Right? That's a very different set of data, but it's still data. And world-class entrepreneurs who operate in new markets, you know, the Steve Jobs, the Elon Musks, et cetera, have a great combination of art, science, reality distortion field, and great pattern recognition skills for things that people, other normal people, can barely see that signal out of noise. So, so going on that, do you feel that sometimes we pay too much attention to data and not what's going on in the present? Too much attention to data. I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I think, you know, Silicon Valley is funded and founded on, on people who are hallucinating, not, not people who are spending money on data. That's actually been proven um, if you've seen some of the movies. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley is the valley of hope um, and dreams, and uh, it, it's probably the best uh, example of capitalism and what differentiates our version of capitalism from anywhere else in the world. It, it's certainly different from how capitalism works in Europe. It's very different on entrepreneurship in, in China uh, or certainly in Russia. You, you know, and I, I tend to me measure the amount of, of visionary entrepreneurship that can be done in a country by actually how they treat their dissidents and artists. Hmm. That is, in the U.S., there's no bounding box about what you could do. You know, in the U.S., you could be insane and you don't go to jail or you could speak truth to power and you know, Gandhi's quote is, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. But that's true in the U.S. In, in other countries, you know, first they ignore you, then they jail you, and then they kill you. Yeah. Um, and, and don't laugh. So name your favorite country and try to, try to take on a state-owned enterprise or something where a political leader doesn't like the book you just wrote in Hong Kong. You tend to disappear. Uh, yeah. There is no bounding box on disruptive innovation in the U.S. Yeah. Um, rent seekers might try to own markets, see Tesla and car distributors and et cetera, but you don't disappear. Yeah. And that means the type of innovation we could do here is probably unique anywhere else in the world. Yeah. So speaking of innovation, I'm sure there are a lot of entrepreneurs, and I've actually been approached by several that are in the room that are looking for new and innovative ideas. Do you have any good ideas that are going to be the next billion dollar idea? Yeah, the minute you hear the next big idea in a conference, it's probably too late. Um, <laughs> I still want to know. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you, know there's a, um, you know, I think there's a whole set of interesting technologies, um, all the way from life sciences, uh, you know, and CRISPR and, and gene editing. And by the way, note to Guy Kawasaki, in that industry, you don't leave your bedroom without a patent. Um, but in our industry, in, in mobile and, and, and high tech, uh, machine intelligence, robotics, drones, et cetera, all are going to merge in a very interesting and scary way. Yeah, um, they will. Uh, and I, I think the, uh, the other thing people haven't understood is that social media, uh, unfortunately, uh, while it's in the press interest to tell us it's brought us together, has actually made us more separate. Um, and I think if you look at the trends in, um, in politics and what's going on in, in countries today, it's an unintended consequence that's not been read about or addressed via startups. And I think um, thoughtful people who start building startups are going to figure out how to do that. I, I should mention to the audiences, how many of you are in your 20s and 30s? You know, Good for you guys. Um, been, <laughs> been there, done that. And, and I have yeah, to tell early you. Early 40s. Yeah, early 40s. And I have to tell you, uh, you know, spend your time going for it now. But, but as you get older, you know, in my 20s and 30s, it was about me, me, and me. And, and I think that's the way life is kind of organized. But as you get older, you start thinking about other things as well. And for those of you who do get to be successful, you need to figure out how to give back to 
God, country, community, and family. And so my first 20 years, I just kind of totaled it up. I gave about 20 years to being a high-tech entrepreneur, but I've given another 20 years to God, country, community, and family. And eventually you need to start thinking about the purpose of life, not just having a great time in the valley, which you should all do. And by the way, if you're not having a great time, don't do this. Do something else that you're going to enjoy. So when you say give back, how can these entrepreneurs give back? Well, you know, the, the Valley is kind of built on a pretty unique culture, this pay it forward culture, where if you're successful, you have, if you haven't gotten the memo, a social obligation in Silicon Valley to help other entrepreneurs. And I don't mean just funding them, it just might be advice, it might be coffee, it might be connections, it might be whatever. That pay it forward culture is what makes Silicon Valley unique and our and our visitors to the Valley are just blown away when they hear about it. And I was helped and I practice that a lot. I mean, it's why I teach. Teaching happens to be a way to give back. Um, you know, the whole Lean Startup was a methodology. It was me trying to figure out, wait a minute, was this the most efficient way to build startups? Answer, yeah. no. Here's another one. And I certainly, I enjoy teaching. And so I'm not only doing that, the whole Lean Startup methodology has been adopted uh, by the National Science, Foundation, National Science Foundation and the US government as the standard for commercializing science in the United States. And at Stanford uh, next month, we're starting a new program called Hacking for Defense, which allows students to actually give back to national service by wow. solving real government problems. Um, and so we're gonna see how that goes. And if we could scale that to uh, 50 or 100 universities, we have the 21st century equivalent of tech ROTC for the country. So those are some examples of giving back. Yeah, those are great examples of giving back. I, I, you know, that's one reason why I love Startup Grind so much is because Startup Grind is all, is all about helping other people. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what we're here for, is to help other people. I mean, obviously, we want to help our startups and build and grow and build unicorns, but truly, like, you guys, let's really help each other. So make sure you take the time today and the rest of the week to really help somebody else because that's what's really gonna help help every single person and help our country, you know, God, country, government, everything. Great. You guys, let's give it up for Steve. Thank you, Josh. That was great, thank you.